I, first of all, just, you know, this is um, the one year anniversary this weekend of my father's passing. And we're also celebrating, uh, remembering Noam, who Enom was birthed out of his memory, uh, which uh, is the 40th memorial here today. And so I, I think uh, I just really want to dedicate uh, before God uh, an incredible brother and uh, what I believe is also being a remarkable father in, in my own life. Um, and uh, with that, uh, we'll move on to speak today of something that, you know, I, I really felt exercised over as I studied this particular Parsha Shalak, Leka. Uh, and please forgive me for my Hebrew. Uh, uh, I'm not very linguistic. I'm still learning the English language. And, uh, but I, I really appreciate you learning how to have patience with this guy. Um, but, um, but when you, when you see uh, this photograph, or pardon me, this art rendering uh, of Joshua and Caleb holding that up, I'm hoping you can get a picture after today of Echad, meaning one, uh, and, and even seeing that Joshua and that Caleb as like Jew and non-Jew or Israel and the nations, uh, and, and, and all of us just gain a gleaning that uh, this is the heart of our Father, uh, that we would come into a greater Echad together, and Enom, uh, is 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 really uh, one one tool we believe, and one exercise that we believe is helping to bring us together, uh, and 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 sometimes in a challenging way. And Parsha Shalakleka is I, I found it really interesting that of the eight hundred and eighty five occurrences of the word Echad, meaning one used in the Tanakh, uh, used in the Hebrew scriptures, it's actually, in fact, used 122 times just in the book of Numbers alone, uh, and 13 times in uh, this particular Parsha. So I think, you know, especially with Enom is, you know, having one of its principles of trying to help us come into uh, understanding what is a one God? How do we come into the oneness of this one God? Uh, and how do we do it as Jews and non-Jews? Uh, this book is like loaded with that particular word. Um, of course, many of us are familiar with this Parsha because it's about Moses sending out 12 spies. One leader from each tribe to explore the land of Israel to return with the intel and the fruit of the land. And despite the positive report of Joshua and Caleb, the people are obviously frightened. Um, God threatens to wipe out the children of Israel, but relents when Moses intercedes on their behalf. God announces that all those who left Egypt would not enter the land of Israel except for Joshua and Caleb and those under military age, under 20 years of age. You know, sounds like a pretty harsh judgment, and, and yet we find that uh, in its outworkings in this Parsha. Uh, Moses instructs the Israelites after entering the land in preparation that when they would enter the land regarding offerings made by fa fire, and interestingly enough, how to treat the so strangers that sojourn with them. Also the observance of Sabbath and the law of the Tzitzit. Those are the fringes for those of us as Christians that may not have seen a Jewish person who is an observant religious one that ha wears the Tzitzit or the fringes uh, on the corners of their garments. The session plan, you know, I'm right now in the place of introducing the topic and questions, but we're going to have a breakout session. Each one of us are going to break out into what's called a Havruta study. And 
that will be a, a time where there's going to be a little bit more sharing and discussion. Then we're all going to be brought back in. And when we're brought back in, we're going to hear some of the highlights of what took place in our breakout sessions. And I'm sure there'll be some concluding thoughts. So what are the three questions I'm hoping to pose for us to uh, give some meditative thought to do it to? Uh, the first one is God is one, achad. What does oneness mean before God? between Israel and the nations. So I'm hoping we could be challenged with this question and it will create some healthy discussion. Uh, another question that might be a little bit awkward for some of us, uh, but, but I think it's healthy to discuss is, can there exist two standards or two laws? One for the Jews and one for the strangers that sojourn or join with them. And what does the Torah have to say about this? And the third, is what does God require of Israel and the strangers that sojourn with them so that they can ultimately work together and bring pleasure uh, to the Father? So let's try and uh, look at those questions. Let them be our filters uh, in today's session. So let me just give a, a little bit of what was going through my heart and mind. Ehad, one before the Lord. Let's consider, consider two of the Shalakim, Joshua and Caleb. Joshua was sent as a representative for the tribe of Ephraim. And, and Joshua was an Ephraimite. Caleb, interesting enough, was sent as a representative for the tribe of Judah. And so one of the questions I'm posing is, in light of everything else, is was Caleb a Gentile? What? A Gentile representing the celebrated tribe of Judah? Yes, Caleb was from the tribe of Judah, as Numbers 13, 6 tells us. But he was not born into the tribe of Judah, which is interesting. He was born a Kenizzite. He was a descendant of Esau's grandson. And we find this written in Joshua 14, 6. So that, uh, I'm sure, should add some interesting discussion for some of us. Coming from the scouting out of the land with a good report of God's faithfulness were two spies, a Jew named Joshua from the tribe of Ephraim and, it, and perhaps a Gentile named Caleb representing the tribe of Judah. Um, how is it that Caleb, potentially a Gentile, is seen as a faithful part of Israel? How is it also that Rahab, who's in this week's half Torah, Joshua 2, and even Ruth, who we also uh, somehow is, I believe, is also related in today's discussion, were seen as faithful members of Israel. Were they all proselytes who went through a, a holy conversion ritual? Or was it, as we read in Deuteronomy, in the case of Caleb, it was because he wholly followed Hashem. Okay. I hope we're not feeling too uncomfortable here. This is not intended to do that. Just create a healthy discussion. You know, as Jews and Gentiles, we've got to learn how to dance together. And so we are in that dance today. It just so happens that right after introducing us to Caleb, and I find this very ironic, very interesting, that we read instructions about how a gare, a non-native born sojourner, should bring his korban ola, his elevation offering. Uh, very, very interesting. So these are things that have struck me in my study. When I go back to last week's study with um, uh, Gabriel, you know, you know, and we didn't really spend a lot of time in this, but boy, Gabriel, I really enjoyed this. Thank you very much. Uh, th that, you know, we see this expanding invitation, this evolving invitation that brings us into drawing closer to God. And I'm wondering if we're seeing it even in our own midst in the lives we live right now. But, you know, it begins with the priesthood, the Levites that were presented for ceremony cleansing for service. Israelites ultimately sought opportunity to present the Passover offering after being ritually unclean. Then, as outsiders, you know, who wish to celebrate the Passover, uh, also 
you know, learn some Israelite regulations to be a part of it. But ultimately, we see this huge stretch that Moses invites Hobab, Jethro. And I'd like to say um, on Father's Day, this was probably the father figure for Moses. His biological father, eh, uh, didn't really spend a lot of time with him. Pharaoh, eh, 40 years, but must have been a difficult father figure. But however, it was Jethro, also known as Hobad, that this Moses, you know, connected to it. And we see, especially in Exodus 18, this father-son relationship. You know, again, Jethro's one of those goys. Uh, so, and, and, and just being refreshed with some of the scriptures from last week. Uh, I mean, look at what Moses says to uh, Hobab, uh, his father-in-law. Uh, he says, we are setting up for the place which God has said, I will give it to you. Come with us and we will be generous for you. For God has promised to be generous to Israel. Uh, you know, he, he says, and when a stranger, you know, we read also that went with some of the scriptures that were provided by uh, Gabriel last week. And when a stranger who resides with you would offer a Passover sacrifice to Hashem, it must be offered in accordance with the rules and rights of the Passover sacrifice. There shall be one law for you, whether stranger or citizen of the country. Ouch! I'm feeling that as a goy. Uh, it, it goes on to say, in verse 31, he said, please do not leave us. And as much as I know where we should camp in the wilderness, you could be our guide. You know, we're, you know, these are Moses pleading with his father-in-law. So if you come with us, we will extend to you the same bounty that God grants us. Wow. It's like a pretty good deal. Anyway, do these, do some of these things, are they still functional today? You know, and, and again, let's go back to today's Torah, Numbers 15, verse 14. And when throughout the ages, a stranger who has taken up residence with you, or one who lives among you, would present an offering by fire of pleasing uh, aroma or odor to Hashem, as you do, so it shall be done by the rest of the congregation. There shall be one law for you and for the resident stranger. It shall be a law for all times throughout the ages. You and the stranger shall be alike before Hashem. Wow. The same ritual and the same rule shall apply to you and to the stranger who resides amongst you. It's like, these are the house rules. You want to be a part of the adoption into this family? Well, you know, we do things maybe a little bit differently than you guys do. And we want to be a light to you. We want to teach you these things. And we want to invite you to be a part of it. You know, this really is challenging, I think, for some of us Gentiles, and we need to try to discover, you know, what is there something here? Is this evolution of what's happening of Jew and Gentile coming together? Is there something more in this? Isaiah 56, I mean, speaks into this too. As for the foreigner, foreigners who attach themselves to the Lord, to minister to him and, and to love the name of the Lord, to be his servants, all who keep the Shabbat and do not profane it, and who hold fast to my covenant, I will bring them to my sacred mount, and I will let them rejoice in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and sacrifices shall be welcome on my altar, for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples. I, I, I really believe that we are entering um, in longing, uh, many of us Christian Zionists who are even, you know, participating in the Enom Torah study is we see that the father has a desire and that desire is a house of prayer for all nations. And, um, and there's all sorts of prophecies that speak into this. So um, just to give us a little bit of a prayer focus uh, for Shalak is, 
uh, something that I came across, which I, I found quite, quite interesting, um, that the 13th blessing from um, uh, the Shimona Ezra, the Ham Amada, blesses Hashem for the righteous. Uh, it includes a thanksgiving for righteous sojourners who have become a part of Israel. So I'm hoping that through the process of today, if you're a Gentile, a non-Jew, that we could come to that place of thanking Hashem that through the one God of Israel, that we have become a part of the broader family of Israel. And that we might follow the example of some of those who have joined themselves with Israel, like a Caleb, like a Rahab, like a Ruth, etc. If you are Jewish, I, I'm hoping that you could also thank Hashem for some of your Gentile brothers and sisters who are awakening to this desire to be part of the greater family uh, of the one God of Israel. And, 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 and from a place of, uh, in that Thanksgiving, uh, knowing that we're not all, we're just in the awakening stage. We haven't really got all the sleep out of our eyes yet. So we're, we're going to need to walk this journey together. And so hopefully Enom is that for many of us. And uh, the prayer is there. And feel free that as you break out, if one of you wants to declare that uh, amongst yourselves, uh, please feel that freedom to do that. So Ruth is, she's ready to share. <laughs> well, I'll, just, I'll just share the one example I, I gave of uh, Naaman, who came from a pagan land to see the prophet of Israel and initially refused to dip in the Jordan because he didn't believe that the Israelite source, the source of life, the river, was any better than his own source of life from whatever country he came from. And finally, he does it. And when he's healed, he realizes that the God of Israel is the God of all the earth. But he doesn't convert to Judaism. He takes a donkey and puts two bags of dirt on the donkey and takes it back to his homeland and dumps it out. So he's connected with the land of Israel, with the people of Israel, and with the God of Israel. Because he saw the power of that God. Excellent. So is the lesson to uh, collect dirt from the Holy Land and spread it around? Maybe that's kind of how we need to... <laughs> no, the, les the, les the lesson is the same one that Paul said, that, that Gentiles don't have to completely convert to Judaism. In fact, if they do, then the nation of Israel becomes obliterated. Hmm. So what they need to do is connect with the God of Israel and the land of Israel. Uh, if whilst maintaining their own identity. I think in our group, uh, we had Dean, and we had Jocelyn, and we had Brenda Lee, and we had Teddy. Um, we, we pointed out that Teddy really brought this out, uh, and Jocelyn brought this out very beautifully, how when you graft trees into a, uh, into a, uh, I guess, into, the, into a root, or what do you, how do you call the bottom of the tree, the, uh, the trunk? Sorry? Rootstock. Right, rootstock. So when you plant it in, Jocelyn even mentioned that she once saw a tree where they had four, five different uh, branches grafted into one tree, and each of them bore different fruit. Uh, each apple. All apples. Fruit. All apples. Different type of apples. So basically, they're, they're, they, they don't lose their character. They don't lose their identity. But they are now drawing so much from the their their common stock and that stock with its sap is the source of something that brings that that uh, brings them all together um we we also mentioned that uh this is also jocelyn i think took us back to uh no it was brenda lee who took us back to the origin the original you know she took oneness. us right back to the foundations right the, the original oneness being really one soul we see, even don't see that adam and eve seem to be really so much at odds with each other until the serpent starts introducing so, 
kind of competition and uh, with God and with each other. But until then, there was a harmony because basically we all we are all after that fragmentation. We are all fragments of one soul. So if we can go back to our origins, then we will find that all of these different fragments actually created from the very beginning to come together because we were one together in our original form. So if we can get rid of the poison, the serpent's poison that that causes us to to, to compete and to uh, and to not recognize the the spirit of God in every single one of us, then uh, if we get rid of that poison, then we will find how amazingly uh, how how it all comes together, in, in, perhaps even in a natural way, because that's the way we were created. In our group, uh, I would say one thing that really stood out is uh, I was with Jonathan, David, Eve, and Paul, um, that um, Jonathan pointed out that this there is a way to think about being able to do oneness without needing to be the same. Um, and that, that, you know, that that's important. Uh, and I think that, you know, in that discussion, I mentioned that it, you know, there are very significant, even within, um, maybe even some of the, the Christians on the call here, we have significant sometimes theological differences between us that are big deals in our communities where, you know, our leaders can fight about things and people can get really passionate. Um, and, uh, you know, how much more so when you're going to bring, you know, uh, different groups together, uh, you know, between Christians and Jews, uh, that it's okay to understand and accept that those differences are there and uh, to not pretend that they aren't there. Um, because if, if we're pretending, then it's not healthy. But if we're aware and we can find a way to, what does it mean to be able to do oneness with the differences, not without them? Um, you know, that that's, that's, a, that's creating a stable platform, not some type of a pretend that later is going to fall apart as soon as there's any stress or pressure put on the system. Can I say something? Yes, please. But just from my own experience of becoming, um, falling in love with, the, with Israel and the Jewish people, God put a love in my heart. And so... How long ago, Brenda? Uh, it's kind of a long story, but I don't want to get forgetting what I was going to say. But there's this um, coming from being a, what's considered a Gentile, which I don't really like that word, but that's okay. Um, and having to come to a spiritual understanding of who I am, which I consider myself spiritually a Hebrew. I could never call myself a legal Jew or Hebrew, but spiritually I am. And so I'm coming from that perspective. And to be honest, for me, to be a Jew is to be one inwardly. But that's my experience as somebody who is a follower of Messiah, Yeshua. That is all, that's all I know. I don't know if, if you're an Orthodox Jew. I cannot pretend that I have your experience. I can just tell you what my experience is like Ruth, and who was a Moabite. I don't know which tribe I'm from, but it doesn't matter. You know, that's my experience. Honestly, I can only speak from that experience, and I can't speak, I could never speak as an Orthodox Jew. That would be dishonest, in my personal opinion. I don't know if that makes anybody uncomfortable, but that's oh, no. just my no. experience. Oh, that's where you really? are. Please, would you please be who you are, Brenda? Good, yeah. because that, that's right. the only thing I know how to be. And, and, that's, that's, and that's, that is what God is asking us to be, is our, uh, to find our true identity in Him. And I... I, I and I, I can feel your spirit, Brenda, because I think once we visited the land and we we and then we come back and we read the New Testament, but then 
we lack, we know then we, we're missing big time not reading the OT. So we go back and we start studying the OT and then we find this awesome, beautiful people and then you can share the OT and the new T and, and be accepting one another and loving one another. And inside of me, I want to follow the Sabbath. I want to put the Ten Commandments in my life. You know, something that was forgotten, uh, you know, for so many years, the, n not really thinking about it, but doing them in some ways, because it was a command to do. But now really realizing who God is in my life and who God can be for me. And if he's that good to me, well, I want to spread it to you all and my neighbor and everybody who's willing to listen, right? But the one that are not listening, well, too bad, so sad, you lost. Not me, I'm gaining because I'm keeping up there. <laughs> so I hear you, Brenda. And yes, I thank you, Lyle. Yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you to my new friends. I'm just uh, curious, uh, Moshe, did you have any, any thoughts from the discussion today that stood out to you? Um... I brought up one thought uh, about the non-confirmism of uh, Yoshua and Caleb, Joshua and Caleb. Mm -hmm. They were standing against uh, 10 other guys who said the opposite. And uh, they had the courage to keep with the, their truth because they know they didn't know that the, that the land is better than any other. Maybe they saw something, but I said that even they, if they went into the country, into the land of Israel, and would have seen a big wilderness, and not three or 50 giants, but 50,000 giants, if they had come, they, they did come with... The, the notion, the preconcept that they have a promise. <laughs> there is a God who promised something and it's go going to be accomplished. And if they have to take part in it, so uh, let it be. <laughs> so, uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, and Moshe also shared with us in, uh, something that he, he, he's uh, his um, time in the army. So if you could share that as well, Moshe, that was very good. Thank you. I said that I'm getting close to uh, serving in the Israeli army for 50 years. Oh, wow. Uh, I'm still in the reserves till this day. And uh, I said, connecting to the uh, things I said before, that one of the things that we learned, a saying that we learned when I was 18, 19, about 50 years ago, was that, I'll say it in Hebrew and then in English, that zema yesh v'im which means this is what we have, and with this we will win. When we're lacking the whatever there is, but we have the belief and we have the promise, so we're going to win. And uh, that's what we're doing. And so if there's uh, this uh, belief and uh, the commitment and uh, finding the way to uh, accomplish, so uh, that's the way to win. And if it comes from the commandments, if it comes from the heart, that, that, that's very interesting. The, the discussion that we were talking about, both in the group and now again, uh, it's, it's very important. But uh, the, the, the way we're going and the belief we have, where we are going to, uh, that's what uh, brings the, uh, the accomplishment. I mean, I mean. One of the things that we mentioned in our group as well was this sense of two tracks of evolution that have to take place, which I believe are already taking place. One of them is the evolution of the nations into this mindset of, uh, of 
and joining the God of Israel uh, while honoring the Sabbath and while honoring the covenant that exists between Israel and God. And I, I think we see that in Isaiah 56, we see that in Ezekiel when he describes the division of the land being very different than it was during the time of Yoshua, where, where the, the Gerim, where the sojourners are also uh, have a place. Um, <clears throat> and uh, this other track, which is the track of Lo Yasul Shevet Miuda, or that the, the, the mantle uh, and the law the, will, is, will, will not leave the tribe of Judah. Now, the tribe of Judah today are the Jewish people, right? Because that's why we're called Jews, because we're from the tribe of Judah. Um, and here we have a role to fulfill, to be not just the custodians of that staging place where all the nations will come together with us before God and learn how to become at one with each other and with God, but to also as custodians to take on the responsibility of, of figuring out what the rules of engagement have to be. How is it accomplished? So, you know, if we ask questions, was Caleb a Gentile or, or was he Jewish? Well, obviously, according to the laws of that time, he, he became uh, part of the tribe of Judah because he was also the, the Nasi. Uh, the head of the tribe of Judah. So clearly, according to those laws at that time, he was he was not a Gentile, he was a Judean. Um, but he came into that through the process that was accepted at that time. Now, today's things are different. Uh, we've gone through a lot. We've actually learned most of the laws from Ruth. So again, that's not a sub detailed subject. So these things have evolved over time. And I believe they will further evolve. We, but but it will be up to the tribe of Judah. It will be up to the to the to, to us to figure out our role, uh, not just in the sense of becoming custodians, but also in determining the rules of engagement and how this process of enjoining will take place. Because that's what we got. It like Moshe said, you know, <laughs> it's not because we. That's want what we got. <laughs> we got. <laughs> that's what we determined it. but it, as a as can i say something as a as a follower of yeshua messiah believer we believe in the fulfillment of the law so again coming from my own experience because i cannot lie and say i know anything about being an orthodox jew i'm coming at this from a spiritual perspective only like caleb kalav caleb so honestly that is all i know is the spiritual law which god says you shall love the lord your god as one and that's why we're here so i believe that has to go back to the heart of god always back to the heart of god is why we're here can I, uh, Brenda Lee, I, I, you, you brought up the name of Caleb. It's interesting that uh, it actually comes from the same root, and I need the Hebrew speakers to agree with me if it's accurate. It comes from the same root as dog, you know, oh. Caleb. And uh, there's just an interesting little detail that, uh, that you know, anyone who's not familiar, is that not right here? No, I, I think it, uh, I'd, I'd love to hear what Moshe and Yonatan have to say about this, but I think uh, it has much to do with heart. Kelev, right? But it's not. It's not Kelev. It's Kelev. Kalev. 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 It's like Olive. a heart. And... Like a heart. So I, and I, I got this actually from uh, my uh, Hebrew teacher, who's a uh, PhD linguist at Hebrew University, and um, he brought up this connection with the dog. I'm not disagreeing. I, I'm not an expert in this, but he was saying that, uh, that it, it's a positive connection that in the time of, of Caleb, that the, the personality and the faithfulness and the fidelity of a dog was yeah. seen as a very great, uh, character trait, uh, that, you know, dogs love their owner and they'll give themselves really literally to die out of relationship, uh, for their tribe or for their, those they're close to. And that Caleb had those qualities and that that was part of his name. Just uh, an interesting, interesting detail. 
that uh well gabriel you spell dog in reverse and you get g-o-d <laughs> i'm not sure <laughs> well, now you talk to a person who is a dog person i live with my dogs never had children but dogs bring me a dog and i'll know what to do with it and believe me when the dog gets to trust you there's no there's the love that they have for the owner their master is like the same as god the way he loves us interesting they're very faithful animals i mean it's known right so yeah anybody want to share a last thought we're at the end of our time today uh but if there's anyone just one last thing we can get it in just before we wish everyone happy a good week i think um i'm just trying to connect my thoughts here uh but nevertheless let me just say and see where they connect <laughs> have to be brief right paul because we're we're finishing yeah. up uh the the comment that was given about the garden where the originality of purity where we were all one that was the intention of the father and then comes in the the failure comes in the defilement and then along the way god uh, starts a process of election and separation where he can get himself a people uh through whom he can bring his will and his desire. So that at the end of the day, it brings us to this one place. The, the Lord uh, chooses a vessel. I would like just to track back. He starts a process of election and separation where he elects for himself a people. And through these people, he wants to still bring his will and his desire to humanity. And then we have the Messiah through whom we all come into the one new man. So it's like God starts a whole journey of bringing us back to the state that we were first in, in the garden. So that all these di differences uh, that brings in separation are no longer an issue, but the beauty of the differences in, in, a, in the way that we can express them to express his glory and to express his heart to now come all in one place, in the Messiah. I believe that's the intention. So whether uh, I'm a Jew or I'm not, uh, it's like at the end of the day, we are, we are, his desire is that we come to this one table where we can look each other in the eye and share from the same meal and laugh and talk and rejoice together because there is this oneness that we have in this one God that has created us. Mm. Amen. Thank you, Paul. Amen, Paul. Thank you. Well, with that, we can uh, wish each other a Shavua Tov. Have a great week, everybody. And we'll be back yes. together next week. Uh, to See you soon, everybody. The next Parsha. I think you really expanded my mind in the way you presented it so beautifully, Dean. Because I, um, it's it, the way I see it. There are two amazing. Uh, evolutions going on in parallel. The first evolution is the evolution that you talked about, which I think Isaiah 56 also describes. And if we go to Ezekiel, when he talks about how, you know, the, the different tribes get different portions of land in a way that's very different than what took place in the time of Joshua. And there is a place there also for the strangers. <clears throat> in other words, God's plan most certainly um, wants to encourage a oneness between Jews and Gentiles coming together with certain uh, requirements. And those requirements are stated in Isaiah 56. And they include, for example, keeping the Sabbath. What's really interesting is, you know, traditionally, um, Dean will know how to relate to this more than perhaps some of the others. But traditionally, e even someone who's defined as a son of Noah or a Noahite is not required of Shabbat. He has no requirement of Shabbat. That is not one of the seven laws. It is one of the Ten Commandments, right? Um, so it's very, very clear from Isaiah 56 that when God is talking 
of everybody coming and praying together, it's not just Noahite. Because you need more than to be a Noahite of the seven laws. I'm saying this kind of to Dean because we've had this discussion uh, many times with many different people and it's it's a fascinating it's limiting in some ways. So I think that what we see from Ezekiel and what we see from Isaiah is that God has a very clear plan of enjoining Israel and the nations, um, but very much, very much in the spirit of what Isaiah describes, which is that we have to create an experience in the land of Israel, the land of God, the land that God chose to be that platform for that staging platform right for all the people to come together and learn to serve together and to become at one with god this is a huge process that has to take place and this is the chosen place we are the chosen custodians of that place and of what the framework that is going to be about that platform we'll talk about that that's the second evolutionary track that i'll talk about but essentially, the, the the first track is that the Gentiles have to enter into a mindset of that they have to come together with Israel to serve the God of Israel. Amongst other, this requires honoring the Sabbath. Doesn't mean honoring the Sabbath the same way as the Jews does. It means honoring the Sabbath. We have to think about what that means. And the other thing is that they have to honor the, co the, the covenant. Which covenant? Well, at least in the context of Isaiah, the covenant is typically the covenant of Israel. So there has to be a certain, um, not just an acknowledgement of the covenant of Israel, but a recognition that God has a covenant with Israel that is designed to achieve what we were just talking, what you were talking about, to, be, to achieve that oneness. And... <clears throat> So the Gentile has to do more than just keep the seven laws of the, you know, the Noahide laws. And Noahide is even not mentioned even in Isaiah. So for me, from my perspective, the nations with their heritages have to come together and they have to come and learn how to pray together with Israel in the temple to the one God of Israel while honoring the Sabbath and while honoring the covenant. Now, this is where it really gets interesting because like you mentioned, at the end of the Parsha, we actually see a story about a person who dishonors the Sabbath. And it said right after the laws that you mentioned about the same law has to be applied to both a, an inhabitant or a stranger. Does it say whether the person who dishonored the Sabbath was Jewish or not? It, it, it doesn't. It, it, it doesn't. <laughs> it, 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 it says Ish. Ish is a, is a man. It doesn't say anything about whether he's Jewish or not. So I think that again, in the spirit of Isaiah, we, we have the seeds of what Isaiah brings out in a much clearer way in, in Isaiah 56. We have that even in this Parsha. So as far as that's concerned, you know, I'm 100% with you. Um, th then there's this other track. And this other track, Israel has to, we, it, we have to learn how to fulfill our role. And part of that role has to do with this verse that says the staff will never leave Judah, right? Lo yasur shebet miuda umechokek that is the law making mi ben raglav. In other words, there is a biblical determination that is a determination not just for uh, Israel in the context of our role it is the tribe of Judah who ultimately has to um, who, who has to lead this process and has to determine the laws and the rules of this process. That's that that is such an important statement, so much so that we know later on with Hanukkah, when the uh, um, <clears throat> when when there were 
when a, a priestly family took over leadership, um, things didn't go very well. Apparently, the tribe of Judah, for reasons that we might we'll talk about soon in a moment, uh, the tribe of Judah has unique characteristics that causes God to single out the tribe of Judah to be the king, to be the one who makes the laws. And I think one of the reasons that we could see for that is the fact that the kingship of Judah is really very, very unusual when you compare it with other tribes, even in the fact that they welcomed the Ruth, right? <clears throat> even in the fact that David is born of a lineage that has that mixed lineage that that includes uh, that incorporates also elements that are outside of Israel, um, or even the fact that Caleb, who, as you said, <clears throat> he's not born a Jew, he, he was not born into the tribe of Judah. He was the but but Nachshon uh, ben uh, Aminadab, one of the very you know important people in Judah, married a, a woman. Uh, from, from, from the Kenny, and Caleb was was her child, so he grew up in this family, and he became very much like you said, a one with God, and he grew up into becoming a Judean, and he was so much a Judean that he was ultimately chosen to represent the entire tribe of Judah, and he proves himself to be the only one really worthy of it, right? So. <clears throat> So we see, I think there's something very special about the tribe of Judah that includes also a sensitivity <clears throat> to the, this, this, the, the, the first evolution, that the Israel and the nations have to come together. But it has to be done through a process that has the rules that have to be formulated. So during the time <clears throat> of Caleb, we don't know, like you asked, did they go through a, a, a conversion? Well, obviously, we know that in the very beginnings of Israel, uh, even take the tribes themselves, they didn't have, we are not told at least of any women that were born to the house of Jacob. So, uh, you know, you can come up with all kinds of interesting suggestions that each of them was born with a twin and they married their twin, which doesn't really work very well from other perspectives. So <laughs> I don't think you can skirt around the issue and recognize the fact that Judah is described as someone who takes women who were not uh, from within the family, they're clearly from the nations around. But during that time, when you brought in a woman into your family, she became part of the heritage of the man, just like Caleb became part of the Judean uh, heritage, tri tribal heritage, because his mother was married to, um, to, to a prominent Judean. So, <clears throat> You have to realize that the laws that we know today regarding conversion developed over time, and many of them, by the way, are learned from Ruth. So we won't go into the intricacies of that. But obviously, how exactly someone who was a Gentile who wanted to become not a joiner, but who wanted to become part of the core family that could even take part in kingship, could take part in determining the laws and how this thing is going to happen, uh, <clears throat> they required something more than just uh, loving God, honoring the Sabbath, honoring the covenant. There had to be a much greater commitment, which the rabbis ultimately formulated later on. So what are the rules going to be going forward? Frankly, we don't know. We really don't know what the, we know that it will be the tribe of Judah's job to formulate those rules. And I think much of them will be determined also by the, the coming together and how we come together, because the rules are typically formulated in order to consider the, the, the challenges and the, <clears throat> and the opportunities <clears throat> and how to do this in a way that would be in line fully aligned with, with God's uh, principles and God's morality. And uh, I think I mentioned a few times in this forum that the Maimonides, for example, does actually address some of these issues. And he says that in the future, there will be from the Gentiles who will become Levites in the temple. So we know that things are going to change.
But the important thing is that because God gave Judah <clears throat> the job, the role of being the king, of being the, the legal power who determines the rules of this, we have to honor the fact that that's, that's the way it's going to be, that there will be somebody from Judah, <clears throat> we might even jointly call him a Messiah, who will come along and he will, he will set the rules so that things will be done properly in accordance with God's will and with God's uh, morality. And, and it's just, just one last sentence. It's very interesting that the name Jewish comes from where? Where does, when we say Jew, where does that come from? It's the tribe of Judah. The tribe of Judah. In other words, we do have at least some kind of clear idea of who has that job and who has that role. And, <clears throat> and, and we Judeans, my family name is Judah, right? <laughs> so we Judeans haven't really discussed this yet because we're still figuring out our role ourselves. So I think we're into an amazing adventure on both tracks. In, in Judaism, um, a, a really core part of our culture is that God wants us to partner with him in this process. And it's not so much him coming and doing something supernatural that is just going to make it happen. Um, one might actually consider everything we're doing as supernatural because, you know, if we take a look at evolution in its uh, you know very carnal way without leave out the spirit, then we probably would have you know just killed each other a long time ago. So it's it's not really um, it, oh, everything that's happening is in some way supernatural. Uh, at least in Jewish tradition, there is this notion of that when Adam was created, he was created as one soul. And that all of us are essentially fragments of that one soul. I think this this makes it so much easier, at least for me, to conceptualize what's happening here. It's almost like God is saying, "Look, every single one of you has a fragment of you know the original Adam soul, and <clears throat> so we were actually created to be one in the first place because Adam had us all. We were all in Adam together, and you know so." It's not, uh, so, so it's almost natural when you say, right? You said naturally or heavily natural, exactly right. That spiritually, it's a very natural thing for all of the fragments of Adam's soul to ultimately come together as they were created in the very beginning. So, <clears throat> so what it's really about, and I would say this is our primary challenge, is taking our fragment, owning it, authentically, right, in a way that we really connect with it the way it is and not, you know, try to make it into what it isn't. If we connect with our authentic, unique soul, fragment of the soul, we know that it will all come together. It, it, because that's the way we were created in the very beginning. When, even when they were separated, right? Um, and we suddenly have these two individuals, Adam and Eve. I don't really recall in the biblical narrative any sense of of discourse of uh, you know of uh, of them not being together. I kind of sense that there was a oneness already way back then, from the very very beginning. They were one, even when she went ahead and she ate from the tree of knowledge. It doesn't say, you know, it doesn't sound like Adam got upset with her or anything like that. They, they, they were very much together in this process. It, all, things started to get complicated when the serpent introduced into their mind this sense of competition. That we're competing with God, that we're competing with each other. And that blew up the oneness into fragments that we are now trying, that, that we're experiencing together, we are now trying to bring back together. So I agree with you 100%. It's like, you know, going back to the origin, but for to us to be able to go back to the origin, we also have to recognize what is it that created this uh, fragmentation and disharmony in the first place. And that is really has an awful lot to do 
what the serpent introduced into our mind, which is that uh, God is we're in competition with God, we're in competition with each other, and if if we if we really have to rid ourselves of this poison that really keeps us from coming together, if we have um, if if a tree is is grafted into the the root of another tree. What happens to that tree? Does that tree lose its original uh, form or its original characteristics? It's, it's really fascinating because that's really the point that each branch doesn't lose its unique characteristics, but 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 it is but it is not only getting sap or, or oil or gasoline from 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 the fruit. The root tree pro provides a lot more than that. Like I, I can tell you one thing that I think the, is being said in the in this parsha, because as being pointed out, it says that there will be one law for both. But where, where will it be one law for both? In other words, we have to recognize the fact that this is the chosen land for staging this cultivation of oneness. Within this land, there has to be one law. It doesn't mean that in all over the world, everybody has to have the same law, but what naturally happens, and that's, I think, a very positive type of evolution that God has in mind here, is that uh, each nation has to ultimately uh, cultivate their own law. But if they are constantly in touch with a central place, where the law, where they have a common law with 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 the Jews who are living there, with Israel that's living there, then there is a synergy, there is a crosstalk between these different laws, and especially if they come in a way that they are coming to learn the ways of God and the morality of God and the ethics of God, then they these will spill over into the into various laws, into the various jurisdictions that will exist throughout the world. So they will all be different. But they will still have so much of the same, and they will still be able to enjoy this oneness when they come to the land. And even when we will go to visit those nations, we will sense the same because there will be so much in common, and we will all be lovers of God who keep the Sabbath and honor the covenant. The covenant. You know, and. I think in the case of the reading, if we're staying like putting ourselves in the shoes of the reading, uh, there's a way that a foreigner among the Israelites, you know, in the times of Moses and in this, that they would have to behave, they'd have to, you know, to get along, to be with the Israelites, uh, I guess, in the wilderness and as they entered into the land, right? There'd be certain things you'd have to do or certain, you'd have to, on, like uh, respecting Shabbat, for example, like if you're with other Israelites, then you know you would need to follow the same community rules uh so that that would be a practical example of what they would do in the wilderness um and then my question sort of becomes one of how do we live that today like where how does that transform into today's situation uh you know what do we do um so you know what i actually have to, um an example, an interesting example. I just saw in the, in the newspaper um, a couple of days ago. Uh -huh. Apparently, there was, uh, I wasn't aware of it before, but apparently, a student, an Orthodox student in Tel Aviv University, sued the university um, for a lot of money because he claimed that a lot of, they have all kinds of extracurriculum activities, or whatever, meetings or stuff. And he claimed that a lot of them were in like non-kosher uh, places, so he couldn't participate, and therefore, like his studies and his education got damaged. And he actually won uh, like a big amount of money. Wow! Um, this was just just in the Israeli newspaper a couple of days ago. So I think you know this is connected to to, to what you said now in a way. Yeah, like in a reverse direction in a sense, right? Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. That's a uh, that's an interesting point. And uh, where? What country are you in, Paul? Uganda. Uganda. Ah, oh, wonderful. And so do you know, like David, I know uh, Uganda is a huge country. I'm not saying that everyone knows everyone, so, but I'm curious. Is there a connection? No. No. Okay. Yes. 
It's the first time I'm seeing. Yeah. It's the first time I'm seeing him also. Okay. Yeah. Nice. nice. Where, where, are you, where are you based, uh, Paul? I'm in Chira. Chira, oh, in Kampala. Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay, Chira. And uh, what's your ministry? What do you do? Uh, my ministry is called Foreigners Ministries International. So, okay. Yes. And how did you learn about this? How did you get to know this? I'm on AOP. Ah, so, uh, wonderful. Dean, Dean, Dean by invited me. Okay, Dean, Dean invited you. Yes. Good Dean seems to know more Ugandans than I do, so <laughs> it is okay. <laughs> Where are you based? I am in Kampala. I'm in, I'm in Makinje. I'm, I'm wow. part of, uh, yeah, uh, prayer, two prayer ministries, intercessors for Uganda and Rainbow Garden intercession. So that's oh. where, um, yeah, that's where. Yeah. So okay, you're welcome. Yeah. So Paula, uh, I'm curious. Was there anything about what Dean's introduction? Any topics or any details that stood out to you that uh, we can talk about a little bit? Yes. Uh, I I was just up about uh, his questions at first. Uh, the three questions that he posed out, and more especially question number one. Uh, when he was asking about what, what does oneness with Israel really mean to us? Well, uh, yeah, thank you for bringing it up. Yeah, no thank problem. You. Yes. God is one. What does oneness mean before God between Israel and the nations? And that, that right there is really uh, asking about the one new man. And uh, that's, David, I think it might be your first time to hear or not, because I've been organizing the One New Man Conventions here in Kampala for some years now. So, um, but this week, I was just taking a shower, and the question began to pose uh, to me. Uh, the I felt the Holy Spirit was asking me this question. Uh, you have been praying for Israel. You have been standing with Israel and encouraging people to pray for Israel. Why? Is it because you have thought about it or is it because someone has taught you about it or because you've, you've been instructed by the word of God? Why, why, why are you doing this? What, what is the basis of all of this? Are you doing it just as a command from the word of God and if it wasn't a command, you wouldn't be part of it? So I realized that it was asking me for something deeper, deeper than what uh, I have always done, praying for Israel and standing with Israel, encouraging others to do so. Uh, I realized that there's a higher ladder that God is inviting me to. So I began to dig within to really find my, my positioning in regard to that question. And so... Uh, what I began to realize that uh, oneness with Israel must cut beyond um, beyond being told by someone that it, oh, just it, it, as Christians, we follow the instructions of God's word. That is the basis of our belief. That is the basis of everything that we do. Uh, but if we live within the guidance of the word of God only because we have read it or because it's a command there is a place of a deeper relationship that we end up not entering into uh, the word of God must become us we must embody it until we come to that place of oneness what, what Dean is addressing here is about the oneness being a card with God and a card with Israel. If, if, if we are not one in the first place with the word of God, we cannot really understand what oneness with Israel is all about. Because to Israel, they receive this word. They receive it right personally. God gave the word unto them. But to us, the Gentile nations, we now received it from Israel after when they have stewarded it for, for many, many years. And then finally it has come to us. And so, it's like a hearsay to us, but then on the other hand, it's a reality because it is the truth. And if we don't own and become one with this truth of word of God, of the word of God, we cannot really understand what oneness with Israel is. That is why we the Gentile nations can easily 
uh, say to certain portions of scripture and say, oh, this belongs to, uh, like, for example, the feasts, the feasts, we, we, many uh, of us don't celebrate them because we feel they don't belong to us. They belong to the Jews. But really, it is because we have not understood it in the first place, but we have made a choice never to become one with the word of God. And as a result, we find difficulty in becoming one with Israel. So as I dug deeper into that question that the Holy Spirit was asking me why, I realized that if I don't love, my love for Israel does not reach to a level of loving Israel like my own family, and then I will not fully understand what this means. Because uh, the love that I have for a friend is different from the love that I have for my own daughter from the love that I have for my wife, from the love that I have for my brother. And many times I've prayed for Israel and stood with Israel, but I've treated Israel as that nation, as that nation, another nation. So I have my nation of Uganda, you know. And, and But if we are talking about becoming one with Israel, it means the nation of Israel becomes my nation. Uh, if I'm becoming one, yes, the one new man through Yeshua with the Jew, and then the Jew becomes my brother. The Jew becomes my sister. And therefore, this oneness does not remain at a friendship level, but it goes beyond and becomes a family relationship. It becomes a family level of relationship with the Jew and with Israel as a nation. So when I'm praying for Israel, I'm praying for my nation. When I'm praying for the Jew, I'm praying for my brother, and I'm praying for my sister. So that 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 then I realized that this is a much deeper place that we are being invited to by Hashem, that we can be able to see Israel and be able to see the Jew like He sees them, because He sees them beyond uh, through the eyes of ultimate love that uh, is filled so much with grace and mercy that in the midst of all that Israel has done and that Israel has uh, uh, the offense and the idol worship and all the gods of the nations that Israel went after still through the eyes of mercy and God's grace he went after them mm -hmm. up to today he's still going after them and bringing them back to the nation that was given to them as a promise that is love and, and, and he is doing this, this is thousands of years later, and he is fulfilling his word that was spoken through the prophets about the Jews returning back to the Holy Land. But he's doing this after knowing that his children were scattered all over the nations, and some of them could have been assimilated into the gods of the nations. They could have been assimilated into the ways of the nation, but through his eyes of mercy and grace, he's regathering them. Mm. And it's bringing them back home. And that level of love can only be experienced at family level. Unless we get to that place of looking at Israel as a my nation and looking at the Jew as my brother, we can really never understand the depths of what this oneness is about that the Lord is speaking to us about. Mm. Thank you. Yeah, well, thank you, Paul. Uh, my immediate question, Yonatan, how does that how does that sound to you as a, as a you know a, a Jew from Jerusalem to hear someone from the nations talk like that? Is that strange, or is this becoming normal for you? <laughs> no, I don't think I don't think it's strange. But on the same time, I'm not afraid of saying that I think that being one, being a had, being united doesn't mean that we all have to be the same. Meaning I, 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 I do think that just for an example, right? So uh, me and my brother, we didn't go to the same high school. Not because my parents thought that I was better than him or he was better than me, but because they thought that, you know, this high school was good for him. The other high school was, was good for me. Um, so I'm just saying on the same note, like there, there's definitely things that, you know, we can you know, hope to do together Hope, right, uh, you know, um, to achieve this oneness, but there is also in some kind of advantage in doing stuff separately. Of, you know, if we are all the same, then we have like we're not in, we're not intriguing each other. There, there need to be some kind of differences and some kind of 
Um, I'm not saying not in everything, not on every level, but you know, in, in some aspects, we need to be different. And this way, you know, that will help us, it will help us grow. I mean, you know, just, you know, if, if God will, you know, if God created us all exactly the same, we will have such a boring life, right? And such a boring, like, world to live in. You know, being different, uh, you know, you know by the, for example, you know, a lot of Jews have all kind of genetic um, diseases that became, you know, from many generations of living in a close community. Mm. So it, it's it's a well-known fact that if you get married, you know, from somebody from a different, uh, like a different background, right? Right. And those things kind of get less, right? Yeah. Less percentage of happening. So I'm saying this is just a, a, a biological, a, a right, uh, example. But I mean, the same thing is true about everything. Meaning, once once we kind of spread out and we have uh, a wider amount of point of view and a wider amount of um, way we do things, so we can, you know, we, we help each other. I'm saying it in, in the good way, right? We all, yeah. We can all help each other. We can all we can all like you know learn from each other. And if we're all the same, then all of those things kind of are being lost in a way. Gabriel, I just thought, uh, can we just discuss a, a little bit? Of, of course. And uh, being a Gentile? Yeah. Something I, I wasn't aware of. This is I've never heard of that either. Yeah. It's <laughs> of what? Caleb being a Gentile. Oh. Have you heard of that, Jonathan? Is that a common Anything. teaching? Did you know that? Yeah, I don't think it was. It. I didn't know meaning that. It's it's a it's a kind of a mixed. Uh, it's not that he was really gentile, and it's not that he was really Jewish. Like I think we don't really know his exact like background or. So it's kind meaning of if you think, meaning if you think about it, you know, a lot of those early biblical figures were not Jewish according to you know our modern standards. Right. 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 Meaning. Meaning, for example, Moses, right? He's got a Cushite wife. A non, he married a non-Jewish woman. Right. So by definition, you know, according to today's laws, his kids were not Jewish. Now, nobody is going to say Moses' kids were not Jewish, right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, but, uh, but according to, to our modern way of understanding, you know, right. that, <laughs> that was true. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, that's, um, that's actually an important point about we have to always be aware of anachronism which is the idea of imposing on the past a modern culture or a modern idea uh and uh, people can accidentally because it's the way we think we can accidentally do that all the time uh yeah and impose like for example a modern rabbinical restriction on who rabbis consider jewish on a past time when it, it wasn't relevant or it wasn't applied at that time at all absolutely so I think. Uh, I have a question. Go ahead, Eve. Yeah. It's it's um about identity. So, so then Hashem creates us, and um, and we have these identities. And I'm asking myself, does our identity matter to Him? Like, for example, um, my Africanness, your Jewishness, somebody else's that nationness. Are they important to him? Does he want them to be retained? And if he does, what elements of our identity does would he question or would he have us question to see whether it is falling in line with them? His expectation of um, a people that were living in awe and respect of him. Hope you, we understand the question. It's one of the differences too that um, uh, Jonathan mentioned is uh, there are some very significant theological belief differences uh, between Christians and Jews. Uh, you know, I'm thinking of traditional uh, Orthodox Jews. Um, and even in the question of the oneness of God, I mean, there are some things very deep questions of different views uh theologically and so eve i think i hear in your question a little bit i think of you know there are cultural differences there are theological differences in what we believe um and there are giftings you know 
uh, like one of the giftings that I can, I'm, you know, I'm Canadian and, um, I, but I'm a mixed Canadian. Like I have native blood, I have European blood. So it's kind of like, I'm a smorgasbord. Uh, I don't fit into like a neat little box of a European or a neat little, you know, uh, it's just, I've had to learn to live with that. Um, be happy about it. And, um, you know, if you look at musical gifting or dance gifting tradition, like different people from different places have such different, you know, uh, musical, like innate musical kind of expression, you know, and it's really remarkable when you take a bunch of people from a certain people group and you say, okay, you know, play some music, sing. And then you take another group and they, you know, one group will stand there like very stiff and they'll play an instrument and the other people will dance and they'll sing and they'll, you know, and they use different, they use different scales and different, you know, uh, melodies. Um, so, I mean, I, I think that that's part of like, the beauty of the variety that God's created. And he wants all of those varieties. He wants that, that difference of expression. Um, and um, so it's interesting that I, I think that there can be an opposite instinct where people try to create oneness by removing differences. They try to create oneness by changing people. You know, uh, you know, if, if you and I were trying to create an organization and I'm from a very different culture than you are. And we decided together, we're going to create one culture for our organization. And then we would kind of try to like, maybe, maybe by accident, or maybe we would try to remove some of the distinctives of our different people's cultures, trying to create a single expression that seemed unified on the outside. And I, I'm not sure that's, I'm not sure that's the Lord's model. He really wants us to be able to live uh, together and to have a unified expression that embraces somehow right the the big differences between different groups of people um and that's a real challenge when it comes to theology uh because people love to fight especially leaders you know uh community leaders religious leaders when you start talking about different differences in theology boosh, you know it's like a dividing line sometimes it's uh, sometimes lots of times so I don't know, Yonatan, is that common in the in the Jewish community as well? I know in the Christian community, we have lots of division based on our small theological differences. And I think the Jewish community has a, has a different culture on that. You know? Jews have a lot of different, like even, even within the Orthodox Jewish community, there is so much diversion, meaning you'll have like more than Orthodox, like me and Yair, right? Yeah. We will have, uh, you know, like black hat people, and there is all kind of like different variation within those groups, right? And this is before you are even talking about conservative Jews or reformed Jews, right? Or any other of numbers, you know, sub things <laughs> in the Jewish culture, um, you know. And in, in, in every group will tell you that they are the right one, and they are, <laughs> you know, <laughs> they are the the best or whatever it is, right? Um, but yeah, we have a lot of uh, diversion. David, did you have any other thoughts about Caleb's, this idea of Caleb being, I, it's the first time I've ever thought about it. So honestly, I, I don't have a lot of, um, you know. The, the, the quick thought I have is uh, <clears throat> maybe by, by virtue of being a friend, uh, a descendant of Isaac or of Abraham, of Abraham, <clears throat> because it said he was, um, is um is descended from the uh from, from Esau. Esau, right? Uh, yes, and remember, of course, Esau was uh, um a, a descendant of Abraham, so maybe that qualifies him to be Jewish. Certainly, by the old old standards, maybe not the the new ones, but uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. 